coordinated the plantings to Oh, help I just got a thing thing we are now streaming live. We are. Well, hello world. <laughs> so welcome. Welcome to this new book news reading, celebrating writers whose books were published during the pandemic lockdown. My name is Karen Schubert, and I'm the director of Lit Youngstown, a literary arts nonprofit in Northeast Ohio. We have programs for writers, readers, and storytellers, including a writing workshop for teens led by Carrie George of the Wit Poetry Center, and more information at lityoungstown.org. So whether you are watching live or a recording, thank you for joining us. I'm very pleased to feature three writers today and congratulate them on the publication of their new books. We'll follow the readings with a brief conversation about these books. Our first reader is Rick Bursky, who is an adjunct at the University of Southern California and teaches poetry for UCLA Extension Writers Program. He is the author of I'm No Longer Troubled by the Extravagance, Death Obscura, and The Soup of Something Missing. Welcome, Rick. Thank you so much. And I'm thrilled to be reading with John and Elizabeth. Uh, and I will be reading from a book that didn't make it into that lineup. And it's called Let's Become a Ghost Story. It's just out from BOA. Uh, and I'm going to jump right in. And the first poem I'm going to read is titled Science. And there's a little epigraph. It says for Laura. I told her a swarm of bees flying from my mouth doesn't make me a monster. She told me being mistaken for a prostitute is resume worthy. My tongue, I said, was a formidable weapon, but not in the way you think. Her next conf confession was that ice formed on her learning curve. Once past the small talk, we traded blood-stained hearts. Then came that dream, a raccoon sitting next to me on a bus and showing me photographs of her that he carried in his wallet. That makes no sense, she said. Raccoons don't carry wallets. Interesting that she didn't mention the bus. We had yet to decide which causes deserved our sympathy. Everything from flying monkey rescue to clean water in Uganda was on the table. But now I'm getting off the subject. We made love in the lightning orchard. We pretended we were in hiding and slept in the closet. We drew a map on the bottom of, she drew a map on the bottom of my feet in case I got lost. Yes, being broken is heroic and glorious. So that is the first poem. And then I'm going to jump back. I guess I should have started in order. And I'm going to read the very first poem in the book. And at one time, I thought this set the, set the tone of the book. Not sure if it does. But um, this is the very first poem. And it's titled, On Some Nights I Was Her Disciple, On Others She Was Mine. She danced for tips in a bar across from an oil refinery. I drove a tow truck. These were the years after the army and before college. We shared a pay by week apartment. We were phobias. We were condensation on a window waiting for a finger to write. There was something satisfying coming home with grease on your hands, I told her as she shaved. As she shaved, she sat on the toilet and asked, can I pee in front of you? Most breakfasts were a slice of toast folded over bacon or a fried egg, coffee black. You'd never make me laugh, she said, standing at the sink, scrubbing stains out of silk panties and bra. Nights, I practiced telling jokes while sitting alone in my truck. She made small circles in the palm of my hand with her thumb while we watched television. There was a dartboard on the bedroom wall. Sometimes we played from bed. Up, oh, my page didn't turn. Okay, my computer just stopped. Right, I'm jumping to the old fashioned way. I apologize so much for reading from computers. I was never sure if the money she gave me to buy work boots was a loan. There was something satisfying coming home with grease on your heart, she told me. We were a continent of dust. The nights held us in their teeth. Wasps and stars swarmed around us. We couldn't tell the difference. Okay. And from there, we're going to go to the title poem of the book, which is called Let's Become a Ghost Story. Let's scare each other. It's what lovers do. We owe each other that much. So why not? We've done worse. 
Together we're under construction. This has nothing to do with hammers and nails. Any part of our bodies can be a soldering iron. Separate were the punchline to each other's joke. The other night I saw a woman run naked from a house across the street. I wanted her to be you, fearless, warm flesh, steaming, glowing in a cold mist. You can be suffering and I can be sugar, or you can be sugar and I'll be suffering. It's up to you. The more we collaborate, the more frightening we can be. Let's practice naked under the whitest sheets. Let's take turns pretending to be wind, slip out through an open window. Let's steal things. You steal the daffodils from the graveyard. I'll steal the plastic rabbit from the neighbor's yard and finally be good at something. That's the scary part. Are you frightened yet? It's an emotion that must be constantly relearned, like biting your tongue or mine. See, they call me Rick the happy poet. This uh, next poem is titled The History of Us. The History of Falling is the History of Us. When she said, I love you, I told her that my hair flew from a thousand pennants. When I said, I love you, she told me her mouth was a cave. We could not be any smaller. And when we were not that, we could not be any larger. We were a spent shell case and ejected from the sun's chamber, an unexpected noun uncoiling from a miraculous sentence. Sometimes we were drool sliding down the gargoyle's cracked chin. She was pleased by all of this. I was ambivalent. Simultaneous orgasms turned our eyes into fluorescent orbs. She was pleased by this too. We created rules, a who, what, where to calm us and a who, what, where to excite us. And always the good night smell of our bodies in the morning, a tinge of rope burn and melted wax. Let's see what else we have up. Oh, we're gonna jump over to, I never knew my father could play the harmonica. I'm sitting with my mother and brother eating chili at the small dining room table. My father, dead 26 years, wears a black suit, stands in front of the window playing the harmonica. There's nothing original about the world, but we get up each morning and go to work anyway. A doctor tells us my mother's lungs have weakened. My father is playing the blues, which I guess he learned in prison. No one knows who's lonelier, the ghost or the person who sees the ghost. Not wanting to embarrass my father, I don't look at the frayed edges on his collar or the hems of his pants. Last week, I forgot to do the laundry and wore the same socks two days in a row. My brother is first to leave the table, says something about returning phone calls. It's rare that we eat dinner together. Years ago, I would have said the light falling on my father's shoulders made them look like mountains in the distance with a moon rising behind them. Now I think cardboard theater prop. Sometimes, my eyes feel like loaded guns, and I close them for the same reason guns have safeties. I should be telling this in the past tense, but that would be the beginning of forgetting. All right, I'm just going to read one more, and this is called, this is another version of heroism. And it's written in two sections, section one and section two, and this is section one. I was married to a porn star for eight years, though we separated after 20 months. We never th saw each other after that. This was after the army years and before college. She taught me that grief and depression are not the same thing. She taught me the heart has an ego. I taught her that you can be honest and not tell the truth. To be married to a porn star is difficult at night. Now let's talk about where the strength to get out of bed begins. We had become battle blood and dread. In the morning, she was just another young wife who slept in men's pajamas and said thank you when coffee and cereal were waiting in the kitchen. You have two choices in life, to rise or not rise. It's not as easy as you think. Two, her body was an actress, condensation floating above a river after sunrise or the river lying below the condensation, depending on whether she was the antagonist or protagonist. Over breakfast, she said she was leaving. I think I replied with a simple okay, though I might have just sobbed. On our last morning together, she gave me a box of pencils and printed with my name. This was years before I began writing. Sometimes I pretend she's married again. We've become friends and has twin girls with her freckles thrown in their faces. Sometimes I pretend I'm an unmarked grave. Everything I know about absolution tells me this is inevitable. 
I've never used the pencils until today when I sharpened all of them down to nubs. She would be flattered by this. Everything was a compliment to her, even my name, a pile of shavings in a silver cup. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Rick. Elizabeth Powell is the author of three books of poems, most recently, Atomizer. Her novel, Concerning the Holy Ghost's Interpretation of J. Crew Catalogs, was published in 2019. She is professor of writing and literature at Northern Vermont University. Welcome, Elizabeth. Thanks for having me, Karen. Uh, it's really nice to be with all of you. It, it's wonderful to read with Rick and John as well. I'm going to read you some poems from Atomizer, my new book. And um, Atomizer has a lot to do with all the different senses, but the writer Clarice Lyspector always talked about writing being like trying to photograph perfume. And that's how I feel about this project, that it was like trying to photograph perfume. First poem is called In the Shadow. In the shadow of Mount Mansfield, we all have Bernie stickers on our bumpers and dents in our hearts, brains, bank accounts, what we have left of our jobs. The nightly news, a conspiracy of rapid gunfire, police disasters, ISIS, North Korea. Where is the story about the bird I saw yesterday filing a complaint against the school board for the cutting of music, recess, running in the green wonder out back? Once we went to see a ballet recital, everyone was a sunflower that day. The F-35s overhead stunned the great green Vermont mountain above us. We are always at war now. We don't know when to be alarmed. The flag is always half mast. The sound strikes out the crack of the home run. Some kid hit over the fence. You say, can you please repeat what you just said? I couldn't hear you. It doesn't matter. We say the same thing over and over and wonder what country we are in now. I grade essays about stream of consciousness. Once we climbed the 4,000 feet of this on a sun foliage day, like people who believed in maple trees, wild blueberries. The television is the liquor cabinet to which we will retreat after dinner. Change the channel, change your liquor, beer before liquor, never sinker. Sorry, I'm having a problem with my, my computer too. <laughs> Everything's a craft cocktail or locally sourced. Even you are a diversity of identities and it's made you weird as if you had smoked so much individuality pot. We drink, watch the night claim our mountain and the baseball game falls asleep. I used to love everyone. There's been a lot of neo-cosmic activity going on. Now we qualify for the privilege of food stamps, heating assistance. There have been four UFO sightings since last week and the newscaster is married to the pretty lady in my church who knits with her own lamb's wool. So what he says must be true. The second one is letter from American airspace. The end of romance was what the teenage girl was telling you about on a bench in the Jardin in San Miguel de Allende, giving you TMI, but you realized she might need a father who is not in heaven. She gasps, Tinder is even sleazier in Mexico. How could it be nostalgic? You listen the way your poems do when you write them down in the cafes of Kerouac's time here. You are Angelico Americano with Instagram troubled children of your own back home. You're the only man I know who seriously loves his wife. Right now, this makes you the best Volta in any sonnet. Yearning is a kind of loss, a desire that's never filled, the drunk to his drink, never enough, victim or victorious. Chasing yearning, I have discerned, is like chasing a kind of poison. The Pulpova says in the beginning, there were corn people here and love was a yes at every turn. against death. The end of romance knows this. No love letters, no mysteries holding out for another swipe like a pull at the casino. The sun texts its setting over the city 
Back home, children shoot other children, screens in every face, savagery in the invisible, the Holy Ghost weeping over new desires. My young friend told me how nuclear her hookups are, how they like to choke and shag. Isn't it not romantic, I say. My hairdresser confirms the same story. I am lonelier than lonely, for which there is no word or Proustian reference. I drown in mariachi music with no relief. May tender us, deliver us, Maybe the only recall I have is this, my other friend home safely from Afghanistan, telling me of the surgical tents where the world is like triage and you order the grunts to lay it down. Those who are the chorus screaming, unfuck it, unfuck this. This one's called Lying Bottle, Lying Perfume Bottle of Chanel Pour Monsieur, which uh, came out in 1955. It's a perfume for men. And it's after, um, it's, a, it's a bit of a necrastic response to um, the cover of this book that has Lori Simon's um, photograph on it called Lying Bottle of Perfume. Tell me everything he said. That was the top note. That was what the scent would have said. If it could speak nouns, woman, sun, summer, filling the white walled bistro. How oak mossy the world is. How odor is identity's first ardor. His scent opens a portal. He said I seemed worthy of its lemony neroli blessings, its cocoa philosophy of my life didn't please me, so I created my life. The light wafts in the window, inflects the room with Vermont in June, languidly arriving on dust motes. I am an object ponging myself into captures mendacities. His antediluvian cardamom yanks me, a jazz song my father listened to, or a shape no geometry understands. There's something familiar about the animalic scent, the refined contradiction of all that presses into my plasticine skin. Not all scents register in the conscious mind. I hope to seize his cipher accords like Arcturus flickering, Reader, even the sky has a composition. He sips espresso, eats blueberries. His citrusy spell flirts the morning air. He plays the bow ideal elegantly. Now you tell me everything. I want the aromatics, how the blooming foliage comes over me like a perfume bottle's glass enclosure. I see out a Friday morning, the polite ambition of new lovers, this memory an atomizer I'm sprayed out of. Droplets seep into pores. Tell me everything. He said the perfume, the cologne, was advertised as a man's scent in 1955 when it was born to open over a whole day whenever worn. How it adorned madmen and rogues of rogue dukes of thus and such. Fantasy is what we create when we have nothing left to say about a world which has left us trendy, fetishized, empty. He researched me as an olfactory curator might. My social media Lysol life, how to turn moments into hyper-realism, daughter of the cold hard cell. Tell me everything. My father wearing this scent, tightening his tie, his capitalist noose, thinking he's 007, slapping himself in the face. No woman can know him. Self-portrait woman in the bath. There is no cure for phantom odors. All that summer, an olfactory mirage, specter scents of climbing roses, molting their delirium through blowing curtains, the aroma of burning hair, leather horsewhip, diesel. My mother said I had phantosmia, as she washed, clothed my thinking into whatever she wanted, smelling whatever she smelled. <clears throat> I floated until she said the soap bubbles smelled of rusted locks and match strikes. Thus, I never learned olfaction properly, fond of the scent of gas station as much of, as bakery. In school, all the perfumes of Arabia could not wash Lady Macbeth's hands of blood. At church, Joseph's brothers sold him to merchants bearing spice and myrrh. 
but here in this Vermont in a nude oil painting of a woman in the bath hangs above the towel rack like a gender crucifixion. I float restrained in the small porcelain tub. It is like a coffin of water. The Odaleske and I are no mere bathroom selfies, a stay against anxiety, trying to love our bodies. The elusive male gaze floats in from the ether on steam, watches our ritual grooming from the faraway bastion of antiquity scrutiny, the great school of Athens. The aqua wallpaper skins from the wall surface, light reflects off water, my hot pink robe, madness leaks, the ruse and reverie of my toilette has pruned me into the woman I am now. A bather immersed, breasts rising like regimes from an army of bathers, freed from the prison of forever sponging necks in a Degas painting. The bath water absorbs my bones dried violet scent and architecture. The nanoparticles of wet ferns in hydrogen oxygen I float on, the water washing me in places I only let God perfume his voyeuristic thrill of this secrecy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Elizabeth. John Gallagher is the author of five collections of poetry and co-author of two. He is the co-editor of the Laurel Review and lives in rural Missouri. Welcome, John. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Karen and, and Rick and Elizabeth and uh, Lit Youngstown. And uh, especially to all of you on YouTube, you've been a wonderful audience. I, I, felt, very, I felt very welcomed and very at home you know, sitting up here. Uh, the, uh, the, <laughs> one of the things that's been very interesting about uh, this kind of a reading is, uh, is our, our faces sitting here while the other one of us reads. And I never, I know, like, I didn't know where to look or, or anything. So I just, I just looked down at, at, uh, at, at your books while, uh, while, while you're reading. And that was actually very, very, very friendly for me. So I felt, I felt very, uh, very, uh, very good about that. Uh, so I'm going to try to read four poems here, I think. Uh, and I'm going to be watching my little timer here as I go. And uh, the first poem is entitled The Disaster. In the book, Brand New Spacesuit from Boa Editions, it has a different title. But the title was supposed to be The Disaster, and I, I don't know why I changed it. So now it's back to being called The Disaster. We can see the disaster approaching. Some are terrified watching it, but don't know what to do. Some don't want to try to stop it because they imagine building something from what's left. But we can all see it approaching. They talk matter-of-factly over lunch as if it were an expected relative or a package in the mail. When the disaster gets here, they say. Or they talk about it in whispers, the way one talks about the suicide of a neighbor or a workplace affair. When the disaster gets here, they say. I'm reading that the best way to deal with stress is to picture it flowing through your body and then out into space. So I'm a stress gun pointing at the stars, a sprinkler system on overdrive, imagining us this way, walking out into our yards if we have yards or our streets if we have streets, shock waves in all directions. Here is my failure when I was trying to be of help. It's all mixed in with yours, caught as we all are between impulses. Yesterday, I was at the gym on the balcony looking out on a 30 yard square of people at their machines on repeat. And the railing was so frail, it's practically ornamental, a toy rail. Anyone at any time could fall or jump. And we're not supposed to want to fall or jump. Imagining some future above us that cares deeply like little Jimmy Azora and his box turtle in sixth grade. You must feed your turtle and give your turtle challenges. Do we have the right outfits for this? Is this the right playlist? And there's a kind of beauty to it, watching the machinery work, how the gears fit just so. You know how disasters work. Some you barely even feel. 
This next poem is entitled 15 Miles from the End of Time. I just passed a horrific deer massacre on Highway 36 between Cameron and Hannibal. Five or six of them came charging across the highway. I could see them cross the westbound lanes in Berm, and I eased up on the gas, measuring distance between deer and road and speed. And if a deer is traveling 15 miles per hour and you are traveling 70-ish, but the 18-wheeler ahead of me either didn't see or didn't have options, so the deer, as one, ran directly into the side of it. I've never seen anything like it, like the brake shot in pool, the way they scattered, spinning across the highway, one, two, three, four, five, maybe the first one cleared the cab. I don't know, I hope so, for all our sakes. But the rest came spinning at me down the highway, so many spinning tops or fireworks, dead and wondering eyes, heavy and pinwheeling bodies. My swerving meant nothing, but I swerved, a little onto the shoulder, ba boom and the lilting back onto the highway, and then it's just me and the 18-wheeler, like none of this ever happened. So, is the driver thinking about it? Is the driver shaking right now, glad to be alive? Laughing even? I don't want to know. I suddenly have never less wanted to know anything in my entire life. And here I am, overtaking it, about ready to pass, so do I look up? Do I hope to see the knowing look in the driver's eyes, a kind of lamenting Jesus for us all? Peace unto you, the least of my children. At some point, you find yourself home or wherever you're going. Easy enough to say. But even, but even there, the moments pile up. In aggregate, someone on the radio just said about something to do with presidents or the Justice Department. I really wasn't listening, but I caught that in aggregate. I repeat, in aggregate, how in aggregate we make it home. In aggregate, there will be more deer tomorrow attempting Highway 36. In aggregate, you will run out of time as if it were a house and then a house on fire and you will look back and wonder where you are, where anyone is. I still have four minutes. I'm doing great. Have plenty of time for two more poems. That last poem I read um, uh, kind of in honor of my daughter because she is driving across central Missouri today, and I hope she's having a much better trip than 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 that day I had. Uh, and this this poem here is about me looking out my window at my next door neighbor, um, who then they sold their house, and now the people bought the house, and they've torn all the trees out that were there, and they're building a big shed for the for the guy's boat and his four wheelers. But this is before that, this is prior. My life in brutalist architecture. My neighbor to the left had a stroke a couple years ago. It didn't look like he was gonna make it and then he made it. I'm watching him from my window as he makes his slow way across his yard with some tree branches that fell in last night's storm. Three steps, wait, three steps, it's a hard slog. Watching, I want to pitch in. And we do at such times, wanting to help. But on the other hand, it's good to be as physical as possible in recovery. Maybe this is part of his rehab. Maybe this is doctor's orders, do yard work. And here comes his wife across the yard anyway to give a hand with a large branch. She's able to quickly overtake him. And she folds into the process smoothly. No words between them that I can make out. It's another part of what makes us human, weighing the theory of mind, watching each other struggle or perform, anticipating each other's thoughts as the abject hovers uncannily in the background, threatening to break through the fragile borders of the self. What's it like to be a bat, we ask? The bats don't respond. How usually our lives unfold at the periphery of catastrophes happening to others. I'm reading, while my neighbor struggles, that the squirrel population in New England is in the midst of an unprecedented boom. A recent abundance of acorns is the reason for this surge in squirrel populations, most particularly in New Hampshire. They're everywhere being squirrely, squirreling acorns away. We call it squirrel NATO because it's all around us, circling and dangerous and kind of funny. 
Language springs from the land. And through our imagination, we become human. They're back in the house now. We name the things we see, or they name themselves into our existence, whichever, and then we use those names for things we don't understand, what we can't express. Wind becomes spirit, becomes ghost. Mountain becomes God. The land springs up before us. It shakes us and pushes us over. Ooh, I got one minute, so I'm going to hurry to this one here. Get out of jail free. Natalie was telling me this morning that she's always felt responsible for our cat Dixie's death several years ago. She's never mentioned it before, and now here we are, end of April, and she's confessing. As you would expect, it comes down to, I pushed her off my chair, and then a few days later, she died. They're coming for us, the secret police, for our imagined murders and betrayals. I likewise killed our cat Lowell 15 years ago. I still think about it, how he came into the bathroom and I pointed the hairdryer at him and he ran out into the living room, jumped up on the couch and died. What are the last things any of us have said to anyone who then died? How the sun will rise tomorrow becomes the sun will not rise tomorrow, but until then it will. And now the sudden significance of breakfast chatter or some short response to a question just as you were getting off work. The last thing I said to Roger, though he didn't actually die for another six months, was a text. As he wasn't around much, was kind of hiding out. Are you sick, I asked. People are telling me you're ill. How are you? I felt good about it at the time, sending that text, but he never replied. So now I feel bad that I was maybe invading his privacy. But he'd been a friend of mine, and I thought we still were, but we weren't by then. As the next year, a student wrote a poem in one of my classes in his honor, accusing all of us who worked with him of not caring, of not being there for him, how he felt like he had to hide, that we were trying to get him fired for being sick. You throw your heart and you keep throwing your heart. You lose people and things. And this is how they come back. They leave you no choice. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thank you all. That was an incredible reading. We were talking before the readings about how these manuscripts are in conversation. And I really look forward to sharing some of those ideas. And I'm going to ask Rick to please kick off the conversation. Well, I, I have a, a question slash comment about form. As I was reading Elizabeth's book, I noticed there were five different forms in her book. And I have just a couple of them in mind. And uh, in John's book, he's pretty consistent in the form he writes in. So I'm curious, question for the group. Um, Elizabeth, how do you choose the form or does the form choose the, po the poem? And John, the second part of the question aims at you. If you wrote in a different form, and I'm sure through your varied and amazing career, you've written in many forms, but does the form change the poem? We all remember that cliche, form follows function. But I think in poetry, it's not that simple. Form doesn't follow function. Sometimes form drives function. For me, it does, and it's an ongoing problem. So I'd like to hear from uh, John and Elizabeth here. Well, it... That, thanks for that question, Rick. And um, it's a good one. And it's, it's uh, an important question, right? Like uh, the Black Mountain Poet, Denise Levertov always talked, and the, the Black Mountain Poets talked about just form and form content or content and form form. And um, I think the answer for me is both. And, you know, being a strict adherent to varieties, the spice of life, I do try to mix up my forms and also to give myself challenges. Um, but in my last two books, I have also used the hybrid lyric essay um, as a way to delve into narrative. And, and um, it's, it's worked well for me. But, um, you know, sometimes you're writing a poem and you're like, oh, this is highly lyric. Let's see. It's 20 lines. Oh, maybe I can compress it. Oh, maybe it's a sonnet, you know, and um, 
So I think we reveal things to the poem and the poem reveals things to us. And um, so it's, it's kind of a symbiotic relationship but with a, like a feedback loop. I'm interested to hear what John has to say. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I am probably the absolute, wor there are two subjects in poetry that I'm absolutely useless talking about. And one would be music and the other would be form. So, uh, so here's, my, here's my form conversation. I was at a poetry reading one time years ago uh, when Robert Creeley was alive and he was the poet giving the reading. And after the reading, I was standing in line to get a book signed and the person in front of me handed him a book uh, to, to sign one of his books and asked him, um, you know, like, I don't know, Mr. Creeley or whatever, Bobby, whatever, um, could, you, could you sign it with that famous thing you said about content? And uh, Robert Creeley was like, you know, he'd just given a long poetry reading. He was, he was a little older by this time. And so he tried to write it down for the guy. And what he, what he wrote was, um, content is nothing more than an extension of form. And, and, I, and I saw him write that. And I was like, uh, you know, that's, that's opposite of the, of, the, of the way you said it. And so then he looked at it and he was like, oh, Yeah. And then underneath he wrote, or vice versa. Oh my God. <laughs> and I, I, offered, I offered the guy a hundred bucks for that book. <laughs> I was like, I'll, I'll, I'll totally buy that book from you. That's, 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 the, that's the Creeley quote you want, right? That was just, that was just, just delightful. And uh, for me, that's, that's pretty much it about form. Well, could I throw out one more question and then I'll, 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 I'll give up my time. Because uh, John, and this came to mind when Elizabeth was talking about the hybrid lyric essay. One of the things I, I admire about your poems, they start with a tan, they often start with a tangible subject or thing, the, the accident, whatever, but then they become larger, so much larger. And it's almost like you end up writing the lyric essay in your poem, but you make it so tangible. I was I was also very interested in uh, in Elizabeth talking about the hybrid essay, and I'm hoping that we circle back that we circle back and, and uh, poke that a bit more because I'm interested to, interested to know how uh, how how she works with those once she once she does uh, how that how that how that maybe becomes a lyric or becomes back or stays a, an essayist essayist essayistic kind of thing or it becomes more of a, a poem kind of thing by the end or whatever vice versa. Um, for, for me, that is, that is, that is true. Yeah. You've, you've, you pretty much, you pretty much got it there, Rick. Uh, I, uh, I do, I do start writing about something and, and then it, it goes other places. And, uh, my hope is that I don't completely forget about what I started off thinking about and that it still is part of the thinking, but yeah, that's, that's exactly, that's exactly how I try to get them. That's exactly how I try to write. Yeah. Well, how about how about you, Elizabeth, with the lyric essay? Is that do they do they do they then become the like when you said you did that? Do they become the poems then? You revise them in the poems, or are you talking about lyric essays as being a lyric essay? Oh, you're muted. Well, so I think I I think especially the braided lyric essay is um, highly poetic you know, how it, it um, braids themes, braids metaphors, you know, goes from the statement to the description to the rhetorical question. And then, you know, like Bandy's about all these different speech acts. And it's like, I really, I find that it's a really excellent container to, if you want to braid a bunch of different things and then have the metaphor make sense, but have really disparate subject matters that somehow have to do with one particular theme. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a delightful um, form. I, I mean, hybridity is, is so, I don't know. It, I, I think it's, it's, it's the most exciting, it's the most exciting kind of genre right now for me. I mean, it's uh, to, to think about, to read and to, to experience. So yeah, more, more power to hybridity. I agree. Um, and Rick, you know, when I'm reading your poems, I really, it makes me think about the New York school, you know, and Frank O'Hara and personism and like the poem being a telephone conversation. When you're reading your poems, like the language is heightened and, and so 
articulate and beautiful, but I also get the sense that, you know, you're talking to me on the telephone, like it's very personal. It's so New York schooly. And I, I mean, have those been influences of yours or am I just reading into it? I, I, I think you're reading into it a touch, but I've read all the poets and, and out of the New York school, I think, uh, uh, Frank O'Hara is someone I've read many, many times and go back to quite often, but my influences, uh, I guess, like, I always go back to Janos Fritzos, who I think is a truly, truly great writer. And I'm, I've become a school of one in Eastern European Duendeist. Uh, and anyone could join the school, fill out the form online and send me $10,000 and I'll make you a member of the school. But uh, I, I, the the talky nature of the poem is on purpose, but I see that as a as a weakness. To tell you the truth, uh, I'm in John's camp when I say that I can't talk about music at all, but I wish I could. So uh, the talkiness is something. I guess I'm a talky guy. I always have something to say, but sometimes I wish it wasn't there. That's fascinating I, to think about what. What in our work after actually after just sharing some and and uh, and reading out loud what we wish wasn't there? That's a that's a fascinating uh, that's a fascinating dark room and I'm I'm glad you went there, Rick. But I'm terrified to open that door, so um, I'll I'll pass I'll pass that one on. That's oh, a, you can't say that and then dodge the question. <laughs> yes, I can. Did you see how I just did it? <laughs> no flies on me. <laughs> So one of the uh, one of the things I was noticing when I was reading um, your books, uh, Rick and Elizabeth, how you, it's, it didn't it didn't it didn't in today's reading, it didn't it didn't they didn't they didn't uh, inhabit the same space quite as much as it was when I was reading them. But when I was reading them, I felt a lot of conversation going on between the uh, the ways that you're uh, the ways that you're approaching relationships and. Uh, well, not the ways necessarily you're approaching, but the fact that you're approaching a relationship and how you're and how you're dealing with it and processing it and uh, and working working that up. So that was uh, it was very it was very nice to hear. Uh, well, it was very nice to read the two. It was also very nice to hear you both to, to, hear, to hear you both read. Um, so a question I have is about is about disclosure and poetry. How uh, there you know there's always this assumed. Um, People, when they read poems, do, do you, I don't know if you guys get the feeling of this, but this is, seems like most people who read poems kind of, who have read my poems talk to me about this a lot, which is the tension between, is this nonfiction or is this a speaker? And we, we tend to think that poetry is nonfiction, um, but then since we're not sure it is or it isn't, we then say, oh, it's the speaker and the character says and the speaker says. And I was wondering when, when you all write, um, how close? How close do you all feel to your to your speakers, or is this something that you think about a lot uh, as a as a speaker, as a speaking eye, being closer to nonfiction or closer to fiction, or how do you feel about that, Elizabeth? I'll let you go first. Um, my woman's reckless daughter was, you know, like all. Oh, I think we're, I think we've lost her. Yeah, she's froze on there. Well, I'll yeah. jump in until she's, in. Oh, she's back. Can, oh, am I back? Yes. You're back. <laughs> okay. Um, in my second book, Willie Loman's Reckless Daughter, they, they were all persona poems, right? So it's an imagined speaker. It's the imagined daughter of Willie Loman and his affair with the buyer and trying to, to speak with uh, a feminist voice uh, about the American dream. So in that book, I was constantly in a persona, but of course my own personhood informs that. So the, in, in, in this book, um, I tried to be a little bit more confessional um, because I, I was frankly, you know, had written so much, so many persona poems at that point that I wanted to try out something different. And I think as poets, right, we do that. We try to challenge, challenge ourselves. You know, if we have long lines in in one book or one series of poems, and we say, hmm, well, let's see if I can do, you know, a shorter line, or can I do couplets, or or what have you. Um, so, Rick, what do you think? Um, 
One of the things John said as part of the question I really love about poetry, people assume it's true. Not other poets, but people believe, well, if you were going to make stuff up, you'd be a fiction writer. So everyone thinks it's true. And I have been accused of making things up in my poems. And recently, I forget who it was, someone did a review of one of my books and talked about that. And just by coincidence, he fact-checked me on a few things about ancient Egypt and things like that. And just by coincidence, everything he fact-checked was the only things I didn't make up. But with, with that said, I stand by all my poems as being actual confessional poems, and everything is the word-by-word -word truth. Um, I've written a lot of surrealist love poems, and every woman I've ever dated assumes every poem is written about her, and they're all correct. I love that. So what else are we what else are we all, all thinking about? I'll uh I'll just say about about that for about that with me, which is just just really quick. My my goal in the last few years has been to try to dis, try to try to destroy the whole the whole economy to have it be to have it become kind of an absurd question after after one of my poems. So I so that's one of the reasons of of hyper realism for the names of the people in them and such being real people. And I, uh, I, I said this on Facebook the other day and people didn't take me seriously, but I, uh, in, in one of my poems in, in a, in a prior book called in a landscape, I, uh, I included my telephone number <laughs> and, uh, and, and no one actually called it. Not a single human being in this entire world called that number. And I felt, I felt really alone in the world after, after having my own, my real home phone number in there. And I put my address in there and said, like, call me sometime if you're ever in the area, th that sort of thing. And no one ever, no one ever called. Oh, did I was you like, put oh, well, so much for hyper realism. Did you put your social security number in there too? Some other things like that? No, I don't need to. Apparently people are able to get that stuff really easily. Uh, we've gone through identity theft and all sorts of stuff in the last couple of years, uh, Robin and I. It's, it's, been, it's been a terrible money time for us. Wow. But that's not poetry. We're, we're talking about the poems. It's, it's a... Well, identity so you, theft, no identity theft sounds very much like poetry, <laughs> right? Like, you know, <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry for that though. That sounds like a bummer. Oh, that's all right. No, and, and you're absolutely right. The, uh, the, uh, yeah. And the, and the funny thing about, uh, stealing someone's credit cards right now is, uh, they, they stole Robin's credit cards and they went to the local Walmart and bought themselves a television set and a PS4 with it. And, uh, they they were caught on they were caught on the security camera, but of course they were wearing a mask. <laughs> so it's, it felt it felt really it felt deeply uh, deeply proper that they were committing theft while wearing a ma while wearing a robber mask. So that was uh, that was good. So what are you what are you all working on next? It's been a while now that we all have books out this year. What's what's our next projects? What are, what are we doing? I was going to ask that same question actually. What you what what both of you are working on? Well, you go uh, first then, Rick. Right. Uh, for the last three or so years, I've been writing a series of poems. They're all called spirituals. And one of them is like the, uh, uh, the gravedigger spiritual, the spiritual at the end of the world. And they're all uh, me complaining about God or bitching directly to God. So, yes, I'm going to help. Um, but uh, they're a little more formal. Well, I don't want to say formal. Every line begins. I've actually gotten to a thing where I begin every line with an initial cap, whether it's the start of a sentence or not. So I guess I've been regressing a little bit, but it's just a series of spirituals. And uh, I've never, ever had a book that was so thematic, but there's about like 50 or 60 of them right now. And that's what I've been working on for the last few years. Actually, I think one or so appeared in uh, the Laurel. Back yes. Yes. yes, that is, that's true. Yeah, that is that is. And I was thinking you were getting pretty, uh, pretty old fashioned there, but I didn't want to like accuse you. So I'm glad that you've accused yourself, and I can recuse. Well, the reason the reason I do that's not old fashioned, but uh, I used to write a lot of prose poems. Every now and then I do, but for me, you know, and we've all said this to our students a million times. Like in prose, the unit of composition is the sentence. In poetry, it's the line. So when I make that initial cap, it's always reminding me that it is the line, not the sentence, that something has to happen. I always think of it as, all right, now I'm going to have another stage, another stage, but that's a whole other uh, topic. Anyway, so that's what oh, I'm 
I got, I mean, I have, I have so much to say about that because I, I had this teacher one time years ago who uh, said there are two kinds of poets, right? And anytime someone says this, there are two kinds of poets, you know, there's a problem, right? <laughs> but, uh, but uh, he said, you're either a poet of the line or you're a poet of the sentence. I think it's true, but I, I am trying to become more and more a poet of the line. I like, I like what Simic says about timing being like a joke. And um, so I would argue like maybe it's not the line or the sentence, you know, maybe it's just the phrasing. Uh, Simic, I, I, I like that a lot. Simic is one of my favorite poets and uh, uh, forget how it happened, but he once sent me a surrealistic Christmas card that you had to chop up and put it back together, but I couldn't bring myself to cut it up. But someone in an interview asked Simic, how do you account for the rise in formalism? <clears throat> and this is about 10 years ago or 15 years ago. And he had a great <laughs> response. His response is lack of talent. Oh. <laughs> I know I'm going to get some nasty comments for that. <laughs> so I, uh, I was going to make a joke, Elizabeth, about you uh, these days, maybe working on your metrical foot. But um, <laughs> that's, a, that's an inside yeah. joke. No one's going to get that but us. Yes. It's pretty funny, though. <laughs> but what uh, are you yeah. working on? Well, yeah, what are you working on? I'm working on a memoir about, I was working on a memoir about politics and reproductive trauma. And they were hybrid lyric essays, mostly. And then this summer, I... I don't know what happened to me. I took them all apart and turned them more into poems and got rid of some of them and all of a sudden wrote new, po new poems. So um, it's a book, it's a book about um, biological memory and um, you know, hist the historical repetition of biological memory and um, all the different traumas from infertility to abortion to adoption. And um, so that's the major theme. Uh, and, you know, it was, like I said, more of a hybrid lyric thing. But then I discovered that, like, the form wasn't holding the content right. It wasn't allowing me to, um, like, have the kind of heightened language I needed sometimes. And some of the the poems were too braided. So, um, and a lot of it's also about 1980s New York City culture. And so, I don't know, it was a battle of form and content and that's what I'm working on now, but I'm much happier. I think I've got the, the form the way I want it now. Uh, is, is any of it to a place, is, is any, any of it out there that I could find? I'm, uh, I'm asking because uh, that's what I'm working on too, uh, oddly enough, I'm, I'm adopted. And uh, a couple of years ago, I found my birth family and uh, okay. that that became and, and my my and my adoptive mother died and I found my birth family. A lot of a lot of changes, a lot of a lot of things going on. And uh, I've written I, th and that's the that's the manuscript I have right now. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that what you're working on sounds very, very interesting to me. I would love to I would love to see some of it. Sure. I'd be happy to swap poems with you. Um, oh, absolutely. The adoption one. Um, it was my mom who was adopted and I, I, she's passed away and I, I found her brother. And, um, so there's some poems about that, but it's more about, um, the biological memory from, um, that goes on a maternal line, whether it's adopted or not adopted, but, uh, most of the things that have been published are about abortion. There's, um, an essay that is called, um, some girls write fearless and moral inventories, and it's on Tupelo Quarterly. Oh, I, oh, yeah, great! I, I love I love Tupelo Quarterly, so that's great. I'll I'll I'll, I'll find that. Um, okay. Yeah, is that uh, is it? So is it kind of about epigenetics? Is that is that the word I'm think, looking up for? Exa yeah. Exactly, exactly. And then I, I, what I think is so interesting about adoption and um, just and and the reproductive epigenetics is. Um, the way in, in which all narratives get played out, not just the genetic ones, but the inherited ones from the adoptive parents. And I think that's so interesting. Like the more I found out about my mother's birth mother, who she never met, like it was interesting.
interesting. Like, of course she picked the w woman she picked to adopt my mother. They were so similar um, in their biography and interests. And I was really, in and that I was fascinated to find that out. So. Oh yeah, I, I really, I look forward to that very much. That sounds wonderful. A lot of wonderful work there. So take us home. What's our last question, everybody? Any thoughts about the literary community in the time of a pandemic? It's wonderful to have an American win the Nobel Prize. So, uh, you know, congratulations to, to, to Louise Glick. Actually, yeah, very exciting. This was like, it wasn't too many years ago that another American won. It was, a. Uh, uh, so I guess it's going to be a long time before they pick an American again. <laughs> you never know. I mean, the one nice thing about the pandemic is there, there's more time to be thoughtful. I mean, I, I hate that it has to come to a pandemic to be that way, but the frenetic nature of American society is kind of deadly. And um, it just made me realize how I, how I do too many things at once and that multitasking is dangerous. And um, it's just allowed for more breathing space and more time to stare out, you know, more contemplative time. And so I kind of feel like people are, you know, taking stock of their lives in a way that maybe they didn't before. I think the pandemic that it's most, the, one of the difficult, really difficult parts is especially for like, the really younger generation, you know, that are in college, they can't like commune the way that they are, you know, supposed to biologically, sociologically, etc. And then the really the elderly who are like, the especially lonely um, people, and then they're further lonely because they can't see other one other people. Um, so and, uh, you know, poetry is Poetry can, I, I think poetry can make things happen and poetry has a place in the pandemic and has a place now. It's just, it's a way, you know, we're the unacknowledged legislators of the world and, uh, you know, poets have a lot to say about the pandemic and society right now. It's just a, a weird, a weird mix. It's, it's, it's frightening on the one hand, but I've enjoyed the solitude. What do you, how about you guys? Uh, I, I, always been pretty good about writing every day but uh, I am home more than I've ever been home in my life so I spend more time reading and I've been pretty good about reading too but I have a lot more time to read and crazy as it seems out of the clear blue since I have more time I mean completely out of clear blue I decide to learn to play the clarinet it's uh to my probably my neighbor's dismay but it is uh but I didn't think that was something people still did think about play, picking up the clarinet I think you're absolutely correct. <laughs> <laughs> I played the clarinet when I was a kid. We still, I still have one in my house. It is, uh, well, I, I, a few months ago, I turned in my rental clarinet and bought a really nice clarinet made in France, Perfect Crimpon. It's, uh, and I screeched through it and my neighbors are probably not happy about that. <laughs> That's wonderful. That's wonderful. So I, I've, I know this also about a lot of, uh, I've, I've, I haven't heard too much from um, writers uh, about this, maybe because writers already have a certain kind of seeking out solitude and such to write, but a lot of musicians um, I've read recently because they can't tour and all this sort of thing that they're, they're spending a lot more time doing things that they've never done before, which is stay in one place and sit in one room. And a lot of, the, a lot of songwriters and, and musicians are being very productive right now uh, and, and with, with very good work. And it's not it's not pandemic in its content necessarily, but it's it's pandemic in its ability to you know uh, to take yeah to, to I think as Elizabeth said to to sit and to take stock of of where am I going who am I what do I really want in this life and what really is important and uh, and also then have the time to think about that uh, or um, the alternative I found on most days in the pandemic is just some version of ah. <laughs> uh, but now that I've said that, I don't have to say it a second time and I can go write a poem. <laughs> I, I think we're, we're going to see like next year or whatever, probably a wave of pandemic poems when they finally start getting published. I haven't written any. 
Uh, but I typically never write about what I'm going through or living at the moment. It always shows up like years later. Uh, one of my very good friends, a poet, Ian Randall Wilson, has written some truly beautiful pandemic poems recently. But uh, I, I expect we're going to see in the coming years, they're going to start to pop up in journals more and more. Well, is that a uh, is is that a is that a uh, a warning or a problem? Well, you're the editor, so you tell me. <laughs> it could well, go either way. <laughs> for those of you who are listening, I hope you found some inspiration to write about the pandemic or not, and to take stock in your life or in your life, or just have a good yell and um, and that you are still part of this big community. And John, Rick, and Elizabeth, I thank you so, so very oh, much. It was great fun. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Karen. Nice to meet you, John. Nice to meet you, Elizabeth.